thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, it's really great to be here. This network is hugely impressive. Um, and when Declan uh, was talking to me about, about coming here, uh, I said, well, what, what would you like me to talk about? And he said, well, what do you think? So uh, I sent him a whole list of stuff that I said I could talk about. And he, um, he said, yeah, talk about it all. <laughs> Thanks, Declan. So um, that's that's what I'm going to do. Um, so you're going to have to say um, I got a. I, as you can tell, um, I'm struggling with my health at the moment, and uh, I don't know if it was reported in Ireland a couple of years ago. Our uh, our current use that word advisedly current prime minister um, was at a party conference uh, in a similar state of health, coughing and spluttering, and during the conference, the uh, scenery fell down on top of it, and. Uh, Somebody uh, presented her with a prankster got in the room, presented her with her, uh, her cards, you know, a sacking, a P45, we call it, in the UK. So perhaps you can show everybody my P45, the one with the red on it. Okay, yeah, that's the one. So uh, after 40 minutes, I get the red card and, uh, and, and get off stage. I'm just going to... No, that's okay. Okay, so it looks like, uh, <laughs> it looks like two out of three. I can't promise not to, not to cough and splutter. But I'm just going to get through. Still good. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, just um, why why clinical trials? Why why do that? So, a little bit of context before I embark on this Cook's tour. Um, I'm a I'm a nurse. I I trained um, nearly 35 years ago. Uh, as a as a nurse, and um, as a nurse, I you know qualified, looked after people in distress and so on, and thought that was fantastic. Thought I knew everything uh, everything about my job, and then a guy came on the ward who had some additional training. He was called a nurse behavior therapist, and he was treating somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder. And you know, obsessive compulsive disorder is a pretty uh, debilitating condition to to struggle with. And what he was doing was was treating this person and, and getting results, and, and you know actually this person was improving. And before uh, he'd been on the ward, and there was you know pretty much just palliative care going on. So I thought that's quite interesting. So I went and talked to him. I said, "How how come you you know this stuff?" And he started talking about um, that uh, there was some research behind what he was doing. Um, so I'd been trained for three and a bit years as a nurse, and I had no idea what he was talking about. Not, not a clue. And of course, this was before the days of evidence-based medicine being a, a coined term. So I thought, oh, that's very interesting. Um, and nobody else in, in, in the hospital knew anything about the treatments that, that were being delivered. He was, he was a specialist. And I think this is absolutely shocking. So I went off to the Maudsley Hospital and got trained in the same, same techniques and discovered a whole world of, of science and clinical trials, which, which actually, as a clinician, Nobody, but nobody had talked to me about. Uh, and I just wonder how many other clinicians are in a similar position. And I took a, I say, a pretty avowedly Marxist approach to this. It's okay, guys, I have calmed down since my youth. This is not Jeremy Corbyn stood here. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, the imbalance of capital and, um, in society, and not just financial capital, but social capital, the inequities that meant that people were in distress who couldn't argue for their case were getting what the professions thought. And what the professions thought wasn't informed by evidence. And I'll quote George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw got this great quote, which is, all professions are conspiracies against the laity. And actually, I think that's potentially still correct. So I got into... I got into science and I, and I, and I got into uh, the same kind of clinical method. And I'll give you one example that sticks in my mind. If I treated a, a, a woman with vomit phobia. Now, vomit phobia, is there such a thing? Well, yes, there is. This poor, poor person had been in an institution, a psychiatric institution, for 20 years because nobody had figured out that she had a vomit phobia rather than uh, some kind of, you know, I mean, she self-harmed and stuff to, to deal with her, her, her intense distress. And they treated her successfully because, you know, basically, actually, uh, the treatment's really funny. There was, uh, I, I trained with uh, 
a couple of Irish guys, bigger beards than me, and basically the treatment for vomit phobia is you film yourself with vomit coming down your beard, and you show it to the person with vomit phobia. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's actually what you do. Of course, while her while her partner was, you know, trying to be with her, and, and you, you 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 degrade the stimuli and stuff as well. But it's a tremendously effect. So this 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 lovely person, she she recovered, and um, and then she went to a psychiatrist and said, I don't want to take thyridazine anymore. I don't need it, you know, uh, because this whole thing that's been driving me. And of course, the psychiatrist refused to take her off the thyridazine because he didn't believe that you could be in hospital for 20 years driven by a vomit phobia that could be treated in three or four sessions. And of course, the reason was that nobody knew how to do it. And there was lots of evidence for this treatment, but it wasn't in practice. So I thought, you know, how can I make a difference? How can I try and, you know, I'm from a working class background. How can I try and level up the social capital such that I don't have to be highly articulate and to, to read the books and, and you know, become uh, very aware of, 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 of of, of science in order and, and the evidence-based treatments in order to get the kinds of things that, that works. And I thought, well, you know, I can do that by getting involved in clinical trials. And we just had a two-day workshop. Uh, somebody asked a question right at the end of the workshop, you know, is the end point of all complex interventions work the RCT? And that's an interesting question. Probably, but not necessarily, would be the answer. The, the end point there's got to be a design that reduces biases as much as possible. And you know, if that's an RCT, yep, definitely. Could be other designs, but it's all about bias. And for me, that reduction of bias, and what I'm going to be talking about now, is all about trying to get to the point where you know, we, can, we can level the playing field, not just economically, but also in terms of the social capital, such that people uh, who don't know the field can trust the, the professionals to deliver them treatments that won't harm them and that are going to give them the best chance of success. So I'm avowedly a clinician, I'm also a patient, I spend far too much time in hospital these days, and that's what I want when I'm a patient. So, you know, those of you, there's a lot of PhD students here, just try and remember that. You know, the reason you're doing science is because of the moral imperative that people are being treated in the best possible way. And that's why we do least biased uh, methods as we can. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. I did edit a book, and we did write lots of articles on complex interventions. Uh, moving on, um, that's the that's the kind of framework that actually I've found enormously helpful in my career um, as a way. I mean, we've we've heard things all about optimization, which I'll be talking about in a minute over the last two days. But you know, this whole process is trying to get to the point where uh, where clinical trials. We get more out of clinical trials. Uh, we're not wasting our time. And, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that have driven recent methodological innovations that, that we're getting a lot of trials that actually, you know, uh, I often use this term, you know, more research is needed. You shouldn't really be at the end of a clinical trial and saying more research is needed. You should be at that point where you know the answer because you probably spent a lot of money at that point. And it's, it's, it's my money, you know, it's, it's public money. Um, and, if, and if you've done your research in a, in a bad way or you've, you, you've conducted it or you've got a poor design and, and or maybe you've in, invented an intervention but nobody else can do it because you haven't told people actually what are the components, these are all real problems in the trials community. And they're compounded in, in my profession by this flight from trials. You know, people in, in, in some professions, in, in psychological therapies and nursing, it's very prevalent. The idea that actually you shouldn't do trials. It's a bad thing somehow. Uh, your, uh, you know, the, the relationship between clinicians and patients is so, so, uh, you know, so precious that to, to conduct a trial would, would be to destroy that. And of course, that's nonsense. But um, that's the reason why when I was in clinical practice, um, I was told I couldn't treat agoraphobics using behavior therapy because the, the clinicians believed otherwise. And so they would act as gatekeepers and, and deny, um, deny patients a treatment that we know we had an evidence for. And uh, you know all this stuff about the research waste. It's a terrible, that terrible statement, isn't it, that 85% of what we do He's wasteful, and we really have to do something about that uh, as much as possible. I think 
And, and I just had a quick chat with Marion. Marion might um, might be talking about getting getting greater value out of, of trials. I think that's something we need to do. But we also need to do the right trials. We need to design them properly and so on. And you know, boy, do we have a problem. So I'll show you this review we just published last um, last June um, about research waste in nursing. So we just asked the question: Well, what's the evidence base for fundamental nursing care? Fundamental nursing care is what I should receive you know, my, my fairly frequent trips to the hospital, that somebody should be asking me about my nutrition, my, my mobility, my elimination needs, et cetera, et cetera, my cleanliness needs. And how should that be then addressed? So we found 149 experimental studies. So we thought that's pretty hopeful, you know, 149 studies guiding nurses in their work. And uh, as you can see, there are a range of designs. 136, so only 13 of those 149 are actually of sufficient quality that they met any kind of threshold for, for advising people. And one, <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? One trial out of 149 provided information that might assist the nurse who's looking after me while I'm in hospital. And it's really, I, I love this graph. So we, we, we're trying to think of visual ways of representing that data. And um, this is the best we came up with. It's a kind of variation of what's called a harvest plot, if you come across those, which is more kind of scoping uh, uh, diagram. Uh, so I'll explain what it is. It, it, on the right-hand side, you've got um, a count of trials where there's an outcome in favor of the experimental intervention. On the left-hand side, you've got a count of trials where the outcome is either against the experimental intervention or whether there's no difference. We've got three types of intervention. This is about hygiene. So um, A, which is the, the orange, is about uh, a type of intervention assisting people to care for themselves. The, the blue is where nurses are washing people, so actively doing things. And then we found a lot of trials around oral care, a lot of, a lot of a lot of nurses do research into oral care. And then they're stacked by design and quality. So at the bottom, you've got uncontrolled trials of low quality. Then we've got uncontrolled trials of high quality. So we put them through a quality assessment. All the way to the top where you've got RCTs of high quality. And there's that, there's that truism in, in trials which is often said, which is that the the lower the quality of the trial, the more positive the outcome in favor of the experimental intervention. Boom. That's correct. So we got a lot of trials, poor quality, uncontrolled trials, saying, and particularly in oral care, saying interventions done by nurses in oral care work for patients. But as you go up the, 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 the hierarchy of quality, both by design and conduct, you find you get this reverse arrangement. So I think we've got an example here, um, which is the best I've found so far. It's really, I wasn't pleased to find it in our data. I was you know, a bit horrified that I was proving something that has been said time and time again. But actually, um, we don't know generally how even to do the best oral care for patients in hospital. Because when people do really good trials, properly controlled, so on, we find that either the, uh, the intervention doesn't uh, do any better than normal care or is worse than normal care. But most clinical practice is based on stuff at the bottom right hand corner, isn't it? Unfortunately. So nurses will tell you, we know how to do oral care, we've got that sorted. No, we haven't. Okay, because they're looking at the bottom right hand corner evidence. So yeah, we have a problem, uh, I think. And during my career, I've had to ask several questions, you know, how can I address methodological, clinical and procedural uncertainties before moving to trial? How can I deliver more high quality trials? Uh, I work in non-pharmacological area. How can I ensure these trials are likely to demonstrate a positive effect? And, and has it got one last thing about analytical orthodoxy? And I'll scoot through those for you. So the first one we looked at was optimizing the methodology. And this is one trial that we did about 15 years ago. Um, so just a bit of background, collaborative care is an intervention for depression in the US, incorporating system change and uh, input from a case manager who delivers low intensity therapy, educates patients about medication and coordinates care. So it's quite a complex intervention, I hope you'll agree. 
Um, and normally, what we do when we think about system changes, we go straight to a clus cluster RCT yeah, because we think the potential for contamination is, is acute and therefore we need to keep uh, the change system away from the unchanged system and the unit of randomization would be the unit, uh, you know, like a GP surgery or a hospital ward or even a hospital or a nursing home or something like that, rather than the individual. So um, we thought we'd have a go actually at testing that out because that's a hypothesis. We really don't know if that was the case. And a cluster trial costs a lot more money and you need a lot more patients uh, or participants. So what we did, we embedded a patient randomized trial I think these days you'd call that a SWOT. Think you'd call it a SWOT? <laughs> Maybe. Um, you know, we, we, we didn't know that that was what we were doing at the time. Um, so we embedded a, a, a patient randomized trial within a cluster randomized trial. So what you do first is we did a cluster randomization by GP surgeries. So we got the intervention cluster and the, and the control cluster. And then in the intervention uh, cluster, we also did a, a, a patient randomization. So half the patients in that cluster got the intervention and half didn't. And clearly what we're trying to do there is test whether there really is contamination, whether we really do need the cluster or not, or, or would it be safe to do a patient uh, randomized trial. Results are very interesting. Okay, most people with depression started off uh, at, the, at the same time. And of course, I haven't put the, the, the uncertainty limits in here, the confidence intervals of pilot trial. But you can see that the intervention um, performed best, although lots of overlap. Um, the patient randomized control did almost as well as the intervention, but the cluster did worse. Now, what does that mean? Why, what, what, what do we think? Well, you can't prove this contamination, but what you can say there is that it's unsafe to proceed with a patient randomized trial. There was just, if you think about it, um, if we did a patient randomized trial, we're in danger of a less than optimum design for testing that intervention. So we might end up with a result that says the intervention isn't, isn't very effective, when actually it would be. So we actually went off and did a, a cluster RCT and persuaded the MRC to give us more money <laughs> to do that. So that's an example, I think, of methodological innovation. I've only ever seen that once before. Other people might know of, of that being done previously, but you know, testing this, this uh, orthodoxy around contamination and, and, and clustering. And the other thing that uh, we are interested in doing is, is we really need to do more high quality non-pharmacological trials. Now, they're really difficult to do. They cost a lot of money. They take about three to four years to, to come up with results. And there was a really interesting paper that came out by Relton and colleagues um, eight years ago now um, suggesting this idea of this cohort multiple RCT, and you may, you may know about it, but um, what you do is establish a cohort, and then rather than randomly allocate that cohort of people to a trial, you randomly select people into the intervention arm, and the rest of the cohort is acting as your, your kind of control running all the way through. And you can do that multiple times, so pulling out uh, populations who meet your inclusion criteria allocating them. And the, the argument there might be, well, that's what happens in clinical practice. You know, the clinician talks to the patient and kind of offers them a treatment. The, the clinician doesn't offer them, well, you could have this treatment or no treatment, or you could have this treatment. They generally come to you with, uh, right, we, we advise this as a treatment. So we thought, well, you know, um, is, is, are people going to, because there's a variant of the Zellen design, there's a lot of ethical issues with the Zellen design, so would, would people take that? Uh, so we thought we'd, we'd go and have a, have a look at that. So we did three tests of that design, the ethics, recruitment, and trials test. We wanted to know how acceptable it was to ethics committees to do that. We wanted to know what proportion of NHS patients with common mental health problems would agree to join that cohort. And then in the cohort, how many people would agree to be randomized in the way that just described? And all those were uncertainties. So yeah, we got it. We, we passed the ethics test. The, uh, our, our ethics people thought that was okay. You can, you can go ahead with that. So, so that was a relief. Um, then we did this a recruitment and trials test. And as you can see, we, we went to a clinical service run by a psychological therapist. And we said, look, anybody coming into this service with depression is suitable for this. So let's see what happens. So in the time that we did it, they assessed 752 patients and we got 131 consent forms back, of which 47, um, you know, about 
were, uh, were not consenting. So in other words, 84 people consented to be part of that cohort. Um, and then we went back and checked because we were you know, trying to be, be careful about it. And we ended up with 71 people who consented. Uh, and of those, all but two said they would be happy to get, in, uh, to get randomly selected into an RCT. So you can see I put the kind of percentages down there. Now, if you think, normally in a trial, if I go out to primary care and try and recruit patients with depression into a trial, I'm going to recruit about between 5 and 12% max. And here, we might get 54% of people. So that's much, much better. And you've got much better opportunity for generalization uh, of, of your findings in your clinical trial to a, to a population. But clinicians only... This is back to my, you know, all clinicians are conspiracies against the laity. Uh, clinicians only had that conversation with 17% of patients. So the biggest job to do. And they came up with a whole gamut of, of reasons why not. Oh, it's not ethical to do trials. Okay, you know, so one of the things we have to do, we know that systems like this might work, but we have to work with our clinical colleagues to get them you know, on board to get them believing in that moral imperative of science uh, because actually very many of them do not. Um, and, you know, we've had conversations over the last two days about the antagonism if you want to be a clinical academic with your clinical, your clinical colleagues saying, oh, you know, why do you want to do that? There's a real big job out there with our clinical colleagues uh, to persuade them of what everybody in this room presumably believes, which is the utility of science to, uh, to reduce social inequity in treatment. Uh, there is a separate problem to do with depression, that who collects the data in this sort of cohort? Um, and I think the uh, CMRC cohort multiple RCT system works best when you have chronic illnesses and chronic conditions where you've got routine data collection as part of health service uh, behavior. Uh, then you can tap into that kind of stuff. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, pretty expensive to do, and you're going to have to uh, you have to fund that kind of data collection yourself. Now, we only talk about optimizing interventions, uh, which is the third sort of thing I, I've got into recently. And um, there are many optimization frameworks. And Sarah Levati is in the um, in, in in the audience, and she's done a a, a review of methods in which uh, which researchers optimize their interventions before taking them to trial, and they're, they're listed there from her paper. Um, it's the, uh, uh, you should go and have a look at that because it's, it's, it's fairly interesting. And, you know, um, the, the one thing that we were interested in is, you know, well, how can we squeeze this extra value out of clinical trials? And a group of us are really interested in, in mixed methods. By mixed methods, I don't mean doing a qualitative study and doing a quantitative study and then uh, writing two papers and then publishing them separately and uh, referring to each of them in the discussion uh, of each paper. That's not that's multiple methods. Mixed methods is about where you take uh, narrative data and numerical data and you integrate it at the level of the patient in your analyses. And that's not really, in the trials community, we don't do that. We just uh, submitted a... A re, it's not a review, it's, a, it's the result of an MRC-funded uh, expert summit last year where we, uh, we were trying to think, well, maybe we should get together and write some guidance in addition to the MRC framework for complex interventions on mixed methods. And at the end of the summit, we concluded that we couldn't do that because there wasn't the examples out there in the trials community for us to call on. We really struggled uh, to get examples. So. Um, the paper that we, we've just submitted, uh, hopefully it will be accepted by trials, is um, we only found three examples uh, that met our criteria for data integration in trials. So actually what we're calling for is, is more of it to happen. And I'll give you an example uh, of, of this. Now, we, we, were, we were playing around with a very different uh, treatment so it's called Marita therapy for depression. It's uh, used in Japan, not known over here. And, you know, most Western thought about illness is that let's, let's, let's hit it on the head, let's smash it, let's, let's destroy this illness, it's invading our bodies. And, 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 and actually that's not the experience uh, for many people with depression because they've got to live with something and other conditions you've got to live with it. So learning to live with it is actually 
<coughs> is actually more important than, than, than you control it. And the, so this treatment is, is, is saying you cannot control these symptoms by, by uh, effort of will. And the better, the better thing is to understand that they'll come and go. And, and by fighting it, actually, what you do is you make it worse. You know, you get some temporary relief, but you also add to the, the stress of the illness itself. Uh, and really, you need to think about it as part of the natural ecology. Uh, like, you know, there's a storm coming. It's actually quite relevant. We use this metaphor a lot in Maria Tito, but there's a storm coming today, right? And, uh, and, and what do you do? You tolerate it, and, and tomorrow it'll be gone. Okay. And, and that's, that's like your emotions as well. You know, you can, you can tolerate them, and, and, and so nobody's going to stand on the, on the foreshore there and go, go back, storm. You know, that, that's, that's not going to happen, is it? Because you know that won't work. But people do that with, with depression. They say, go away, depression. Okay, well, actually, most people's experiences that that's not particularly helpful. So we were trying this new approach, um, and there's no empirical work on it. And we wanted to know, well, you know, people brought up in this idea of Western medicine, how would they, how would they feel about this? Uh, because it's pretty radically different. Um, and would they stick it out? Would they stick this treatment out? And, and is there any relationship between how they feel about it and how how they do at the end. So obviously we, 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 we took numerical data from the RCT, it was a pilot RCT, and we took qualitative interviews with people. Uh, and then we integrated them at the level of the individual patient participant. What we found in the qualitative data there were some themes. And you know, the, the themes obviously necessarily summarized here, which is about the acceptability of the processes. So if people accepted the premise that I've just briefly outlined to you, uh, we kind of, you know, said yes, no, you did or didn't. And what about uh, the processes? Because it's an experiential therapy. You've got to do things like, like lie in a room for hours at a time, experiencing the ebb and flow of emotions rather than trying to avoid them. Uh, and, and the processes are, are quite are quite in-depth and experiential. You, you've got to do a lot of things. So how acceptable are those processes and how acceptable? And, and uh, the principles, they came out in the qualitative analysis. So here you can map these typologies. So this is called, uh, the beginning is what's called a joint display, um, which the mixed methods people, particularly in education, do a lot of. Uh, and we, we put people in typologies, and they're individual patients, very small study they uh, and at the bottom left, you've got, you know, everything's unacceptable. The processes are unacceptable and their principles are unacceptable. At the top right, you've got people who find both, uh, both acceptable or not. And then we're able to map those against people's individual response to treatments and people's individual um, uh, stickability with treatment. And this is called a joint display. So on the left-hand side, you get those uh, typologies. The typologies of accept acceptability, and then we're mapping it against how many therapy sessions, there's some qualitative data there as well, and, and treatment response. And you can just eyeball that. You can see that at the top, there's the uh, people who find both unacceptable, uh, stay on average about five sessions. That's quite a lot, actually. Our per protocol uh, number of sessions was five. Um, so some of those people are sticking around, uh, but none of them got better. None of them responded. You've got people at the bottom who found everything acceptable, and you can see that the, uh, the treatment response was universally positive. And you've got some really interesting people in the middle um, who, you know, this is number four, they found that strong identification with the principles, but, you know, for whatever reason, just couldn't spend time with the treatment. We found that most of those people didn't spend very many sessions with us but also improved. So clearly, what, what most of the psychological therapy community think is that you need to have a really decent dose of treatment to, to get better. And that's, actually, we found that's not the case. And we would not have found that had we not this, done this kind of uh, joint display. Um, so people who identify with to therapy typically responded regardless of the number of sessions that they attended. So we'd had people leaving after three sessions saying, yep, thank you, get that, fine. Just can't do all the exercises, but no, I get it. And, you know, really, really having a great outcome. Um, and, you know, people with personal circumstances which impeded their opportunity to engage, they attended the fewest sessions, but this did not drive their clinical outcomes. And um, if the principles are unacceptable, no matter how many appointments you attend, 
And people do, people really per persevere. And, and it's quite sad to think that you're persevering with, with treatment. And actually we now know if they, if, if they haven't identified with the, with, with, with the contents of the treatment, they're not going to improve. And that gives us some options for uh, social biomarkers, for optimizing treatment around, I mean, I don't have a way to measure that right now. <laughs> That's the, that's the next change. How will we measure the extent to which people uh, identify with the treatment other than by qualitative uh, methods which we, we used before? But that, that's an example which we, which we popped into the, uh, in, into the article we just submitted, um, which, which is you know, showcasing these ideas of, of mixed analytical integrative methods, which I really want the trial community to do more of. We, think we, we need much more of that because they genuinely get better insights. Now I'm going to have a little, little, um, little go at the analytical orthodoxy. I'm going to show you a trial that we published a couple of years ago, uh, which was a non-inferiority trial. So those of you who, know, who come, you know, you're all in the trials world, you know about non-inferiority trials. They're different from superiority trials. And COBRA, which was a very expensive trial in the UK of two psychological treatments for depression, um, we'd done the pilot and feasibility work, so we, we were funded by NIHR, HTA, Health Technology Assessment Program, and uh, we wanted to answer the questions about cost effectiveness and clinical effectiveness of these two treatments. And what was different about these two treatments? Well, let's talk about the design. When you do a non-inferiority RCT, you just want to know if a treatment is, is substantially inferior or not, to a gold standard. And in, in, in psychological therapies, the gold standard for depression is CBT. Uh, so it's a bit unlike a normal RCT, because the null hypothesis is no difference, rather than the null hypothesis being that there is a difference. Um, uh, so an RCT, you normally say, there is no difference. Here in a, in a, in a, in a non-inferiority, you say, OK, there is a difference. That's our null hypothesis. Um, so a non-inferiority margin, what's that? So you imagine you've got your gold standard. Okay, obviously you've got uh, uncertainty around the gold standard. You've got a new treatment. You want to know is it inferior or not? Well, if if it if it ends up at the end of you know your your, your post trial uh, evaluation stage falling somewhere in what we call the non inferiority margin, then you conclude that it's not inferior to the gold standard. And obviously it's a, you have to make a decision about what that margin is. So if your margin is tiny in this example, then we would say that the treatment is inferior. And so there, of course, we're setting a tight target uh, for, for the non-inferiority criteria. And we actually did that. We set a really tight target. Uh, now, here's the analytical orthodoxy. If you think about the reason we do intention to treat analysis is to make it harder to show that a treatment is um, superior to whatever control is. You know, we, we make it so that we, we toughen the test. In an inferiority trial, it's the opposite way around. So in order to toughen the test, you really should do a per protocol. You know, gasp of horror from the audience. You should do a per protocol analysis as your primary analysis. You know, the logic behind, behind making it harder to disprove the null hypothesis is that we must strengthen the gold standard so that the gold standard is operating at its optimum, which is you discard the people who don't get the treatment, which you'd normally include in an intention to treat analysis. Well, you can imagine when we suggested that our primary analysis should be the per protocol analysis. Uh, and I, intention to treat analysis has become the way we do things, so you can't argue against it. Even though the logic is, you know, indisputably that an ITT analysis would not be an appropriate analysis for a, a non-inferiority trial, people did not accept that logic. So analytical orthodoxy, you know, we're bad in this community, as, as bad as anybody else for believing certain things and thinking that we can't change those things. We don't know why we're doing them anymore. Just, oh yeah, we do ITT, that's what we do. No, 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 that's wrong. And okay, there is guidance out there that suggests you do uh, per protocol analyses, but we were made to do both. And uh, we, we, we had no choice. Um, unlike a superiority trial, um, per protocol analysis would be frowned on. We said, no, that's our primary analysis. We said, no, you've got to do both. 
even though the logic behind an ITT is, 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 is flawed in this kind of trial. But did it make an out? Did it make a difference? Well, actually, no, it didn't. So, yeah, I'm, I'm halfway towards my P45. Thank you. That's good because I'm, I'm nearly done. Um, so, yeah, we got, uh, we got the two uh, treatment groups, baseline and intention to treat, and per protocol. And you can see, of course, the per protocol in CBT, the outcomes are better. But actually, they weren't substantially better than the intention to treat. It's quite interesting. Uh, uh, for us to, to see that. And then the experimental condition by activation had a similar pattern. And you can see, uh, you can see the uh, adjusted difference in confidence intervals. Uh, and I'll show you those graphically. So what we showed in this trial was that whether you looked at an ITT or a, or a, or a per protocol analysis, um, the primary endpoint, the experimental treatment was not inferior. And that little dotted line if, if the confidence intervals were to cross that dotted line, there would be a level of uncertainty about that. And so we know that the treatment we were testing was, was not inferior. And um, I, you know, I think increasingly, thinking about working with populations where there is a treatment, we would not give these days a placebo treatment to people with depression. You, know, you just can't do that because we know there's treatments out there that work. So you've got to think about different trial designs in order to answer those questions. I think non-inferiority design is probably where we should be going in, in, in my world. Um, and how about that for a cost-effectiveness plane? Whoa. Because <coughs> I didn't tell you that the actual the, uh, experimental treatment was delivered by uh, people without the, uh, the hugely expensive training in, in CBT that, that people normally do. So um, uh, Sarah at the Institute of Psychiatry who, who uh, did the uh, health economic analysis was, uh, I've never seen it. You know, you know where, uh, where cost effective normally lies. All the dots are in the top right hand corner and you're just looking at affordability slice through it. And here, 60, uh, two thirds of the dots are appearing in the bottom right hand corner, which means that the, the treatment costs less and is more effective, at least as effective. So there you go. Uh, behavioral activation, not inferior to CBT, is cost effective. Um, and those outcomes are pretty much identical, uh, and, and we, the people delivering those those, those experimental treatment were, uh, um, didn't require five years of, of education and so on to do it, and got the same outcomes. And that is where all professions become a conspiracy against the laity, because you can imagine <laughs> when we presented these results, what the psychological therapist community thought of it because they've heavily invested in their education and it's their wages and we're saying, nope, you don't need them anymore. <laughs> you just can do this, uh, this treatment with, uh, with, with people with less, less education. All right. And I think, however, we think that's really important for, for people in less developed economies, for example, where we don't have to send people away to the United States for 10 years to learn about CBT. Actually, we can train people on the ground to do much simpler intervention and achieve exactly the same outcomes. So there you go. Declan, is that what you wanted? Where is he? <laughs> yes. All right, so those are some of the, you know, I think this is a clinical trials network and that's great and I'm, I'm you know, totally on board with that. But I think what I'd like to say is that there's many ways of, of approaching the idea of clinical trials and many things you can do within trials uh, and many, many kind of swaps and, and stuff that, that we all know about and, and many different designs. And it's all about the questions you ask yourself. You know, you might, you might want to do some optimization. You can optimize intervention, but you can also optimize designs. You might want to think about how can I get more trials out of this? How can I get more value out of this network by doing more trials? Or you might think about cohort, uh, cohort systems. Um, really would like people to do more uh, more uh, mixed methods. I think the value, the potential value of doing those kind of integrative analyses is huge and massively untapped. And uh, yep, you know, an analytical orthodoxy occurs just as much in our community as it does in, in other communities. And you, you need to challenge those kind of stuff. But there you go. On time. Thank you. <laughs>